Um, morning, church. Uh, may we stand as we read our memory verse. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Let us read together. So then, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Amen. We have our seats. So today, we will carry on uh, with uh, the message series that I started last week. And uh, the message series is called, How Then Shall We Live? And today we'll be looking particularly at the life of Christ. But for a bit of a recap, last week, last week I spoke on how then shall we live? Because when we move from the place of prayer, how then do we live? And one of the key things that we discussed last week was the mind of Christ. And the importance of it is because our minds are powerful and our minds and our mindset actually govern the output of our lives. The world itself leverages the power of the mind to build the age. And we are called as co-laborers in God's kingdom to build his kingdom. And there's no way that we can build his kingdom without having the mind of Christ. And we concluded by showing from scripture that the key pillars that frame the mind of Christ were humility, service, and obedience to God. These are the pillars that uphold the mind of Christ, and these are the pillars that we should carry in our lives if we are to build the kingdom of God. The mindset that drove Christ when he was on the earth was a mindset that was, that was driven by humility, that was driven by service to others, and driven by an obedience to God. And this mindset is a mindset that resides within us by the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit came to reside within us, what came with it is the mind of Christ. And today we will look at the life of Christ. Because as Christians, we are called to live Christ-like. In fact, it is in the book of Acts where the term Christians gets coined. And this happened in Antioch, and it was not a name given to themselves, by themselves, but Christians was a name given to the people surrounding the church, because when they observed their lives, they noticed that they lived like Christ did. They noticed that, and so they gave them the name Christian. And that is one of our callings, or that is the chief calling. Our chief calling is to express Christ through our lives. Now, when we hear this, one may think exclusively about character, conduct, and lifestyle. And that while this forms a part of it, these things are secondary to, to actually what it means to live the life of Christ. Because in Scripture, we're not called to mimic Christ. We're not called to try our best to live a life that is like Christ, but we are called to live as Christ. The setup is much deeper than our conduct or our behavior, it speaks to the source of our life itself. We are the body of Christ, and that is what the title God gives the church. He gives the church the title, the body, or his body. And the same way my hand isn't trying to mimic the life that is in me, instead my hand is powered by the life that is in me. Similarly, as believers, we are meant to be powered by the life of Christ, not to mimic him and not to manufacture our character in such a way that it looks like Christ. Because John 15, 5 says the following. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And a vine is a, an appropriate illustration because a vine represents life. A vine has a root system, a stem system. It draws nutrients from the ground. But the glory of the vine is seen in the fruit that it bears. However, we never look at the branches 
and say, wow, what an effort the branch has made to make fruit. We never cheer the branch on as it begins to bear fruit. What we know is that the branch is doing what it was made to do because it's by connection alone that the branch leverages the life and the root and the stem system to bear fruit. Its job is to remain connected to the stem. Its job is to remain connected to the life source. Its job isn't to manufacture fruit. The life that is in the vine finds its way into the branches and that is what actually bears fruit. The life that is in the vine is the same life that is in the branches. And that is a key note because we are called the branches. Christ is the vine and we are the branches. And the same life that is in Christ is meant to be the same life that powers our, our lives as well. And as impossible as it is for a disconnected branch to bear fruit, so it will be for a believer to live out Christ without remaining connected to him. Our lives are meant to express Christ by virtue of our connection to him and not by virtue of our own self-effort. And how we connect to him and how we remain connected to him is by faith. The first point I want to make is living out Christ, not acting out Christ. And before I even go into the text, I want to just set the context for our main text today. And our main text today comes from the book of Galatians. Because what happened in Galatia, or Galatia is that Paul introduced the gospel to them. Their hearts were moved and changed by the truth of the gospel, and they gave their lives to Christ with enthusiasm. However, after some time had passed and Paul had left, people began to live their own version of what they thought Christianity to be. And we had different versions of people expressing Christianity with some people abusing grace and living a sinful life and some people um, living out a version that they thought was Christianity. As a result of this, a sect called the Judaizers or a sect of Jews consolidated the church or consolidated their influence and they influenced the church to actually, or rather they influenced the church to forsake grace and to begin to follow the mosaic laws and customs once again. They were able to convince the church that in order to preserve their salvation, they needed once again to look at the mosaic law and observe its customs. These false teachers suggested that to live by grace and in freedom meant to live a lawless and therefore a degenerate life. They pointed to the different expressions of Christianity and said, look at how people are behaving. Here's a manual for us to live life. And we need to observe all of the Mosaic laws and customs, even if you are Gentile. So Paul in this letter is addressing this issue. And this issue is a big issue in the church of Galatia because they have turned their back on the teachings of Paul and they've turned their back on the grace of God. So Paul in this letter to the Galatians makes clear that justification was an act of grace through faith. However, it should not result in a sinful lifestyle because Christians have been freed from bondage to their sinful nature. What he says in this book is that Christians now have access to the holy life of Christ. And if they have access to the life that is in Christ, what they should express and what they will express if they carry on in the faith is a life that is Christ, a life that is holy, a life that is subject to the laws that God gives, and a life that is obedient to God. I'll read from Galatians 2, 19 to 21. It says, For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Galatians 3, 1 to 3. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. 
Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Paul, in his response, reveals how we are meant to interface with the life of Christ. And we want, I, I would like for us to note the tone that he uses, because the tone that he uses addresses the gravity of the situation. Paul did not use any bandwidth to explain the kind of life that he used to live and the kind of life that he lives now. Paul went directly to truth to address the situation. Because what the church in Galatia did was, a, or rather the departure of the church in Galatia was a serious departure because they turned their back on the very life of Christ, or rather the very life of Christ that was flowing through them when they believed. They turned their back on it and decided to go back to following the law. So Paul, we see in his response, even asks them, or rather calls them foolish twice. And he asks them, who has bewitched you? Because Paul was saying that what is happening is something sinister. It is something that he does not understand. How is it that people who were connected, who were enthusiastic about the gospel when they were there, have now turned their back on the grace of God and have began to go and try and manufacture holiness through walking and living out the law by themselves? It is equal to a branch that was connected to a tree breaking away and going to brainstorm on how to manufacture fruit. In his response, Paul presents his life as a sample in order to give an example of how living the life of Christ is meant to function. Paul says, it is no longer I that live. Paul said, my life was not merely changed, but it was exchanged. When he says it is no longer I that lives, he was saying that I lived a life before. I no longer live that life because that life died. I crucified that life with Christ. And what he says now is that the life that I live is the life of Christ. He's saying I'm now connected to the source of life and the life that powers the life that I live is Christ himself. He, didn't, he says, my old life was not renovated by the law. My old life was not renovated by good behavior. My old life was sentenced to death. And I, instead, in exchange, found a new life in Christ. I laid down my old life, and the life that I picked up is the life of Christ himself. And he says, how does he live this life? He says, by faith in the Son of God. He says that in verse 20, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. He does so by faith. This very chapter in Galatians 3 is the same chapter where we get the famous verse, the just shall live by faith. And for those who know church history, that was what Martin Luther, or rather that was the truth that hit Martin Luther's heart that led to him protesting against the Roman Catholic Church. Because the Roman Catholic Church laid out laws for the church to follow and became a mediator between man and God. But it was the revelation of the just living by faith that had Martin Luther turn his back on, on the Catholic Church and begin a movement that ended up in the Reformation. It was people who dis or it was a person who rediscovered that my life is actually sh should be lived by faith in Christ. The Galatians were trying to manufacture a changed life. But Paul said, I am dead. And the old life has been exchanged for a new life. And that new life is Christ. That new life is a life that flows through Christ himself. If you see fruit coming from my life, it is fruit that is coming from the vine that I am connected to, the vine that is Christ. And Christ was, I mean, Paul was initially saying that now it is Christ himself living through my life. As I mentioned before, the life that is in the vine is the same life that is in the branches. We have that illustration in nature, and in the scriptures we are told the same, that 
He, Christ himself, called himself the vine, and he called us his branches. Meaning by virtue of that, we are meant to function by the life of Christ through faith. Now, what does that practically look like? Because this is easier to understand at the point of salvation. Because we know scriptures like Ephesians 2 that says, I was dead in my trespasses and now I have been alive or been made alive in Christ. So we know that, okay, I've been born again. But practically, what does living the life of Christ by faith actually look like? Because the Galatians understood the initial po- at the initial point of salvation that they were dead. They understood that they were made alive in Christ. But at some point, as they walked out this life, and during this series, we're asking, how then shall we live? When they asked that question, somewhere along the line, they departed from truth. They reverted back to Emmanuel, and they forsook the grace that they initially believed in, in the, the grace that initially they believed in at the point of salvation. And the legalistic Jews were ready for them. When they were not sure how to live, the legalistic Jews were ready with a manual. They were ready with a playbook. And they said, here is something that you can follow. And if you follow this, you will preserve your salvation. Paul was saying that beyond the point of salvation, we are meant to live as Christ. And Paul is saying that we exchange who we are for Christ as practice. We exchange who we are for Christ as a lifestyle, not as a once-off. And the reason I say not as a once-off is because Paul was writing to people who were already saved. He was not trying to re-educate them. I mean, he was not trying to get them back to the point of salvation. But he was trying to show them how to live the life of Christ. I mean, how to live a life as a Christian. And what he says is that it's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives within me. A practical example. Perhaps you are at your workplace and or at school and you feel bitter towards someone. You feel bitter towards your boss because of how they treat you. And you know what the Bible says about loving those who persecute you. And every day before you go, you pray to God and say, God, give me love for my boss. Help me not be bitter towards him. Help me to be patient. Help me to not in my heart feel the way that I feel against them. And every day you go and you struggle to do that. What Paul is teaching us here is that instead of saying, God, make me more loving, what we are meant to do is to say, I do not know how to love. I surrender myself here at your feet, God. And in exchange, please grant me your life. Because Christ, when you walked this earth, you expressed love because you are love. And because you are love, Lord, live that love through me today. It's a slight change, but it's a change that is, is very key to the Christian life. Because Paul was saying that me, I have crucified myself. I have died, and the life that I take up is that of Christ. So he's saying, take the cross and say, Lord, today I surrender and I nail to the cross my attitude. I nail to the cross my bitterness. I nail to the cross my fleshly ability to love. And as I leave this place of prayer and go into work today, may I live out your love. Christ, have your life flow through me. When we pray to God, we don't just ask God, make me less bitter, make me less angry, make me less um, immoral in my my thoughts, make me less immoral in my practices. We're asking God, make me more like Christ in the way that I interact with one another. Make me more like Christ in the way that I view women or in the way that I view men. Make me more like Christ in the way that I believe you and, 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 and serve others. We're saying that I want your life to flow through me. Because the life that is in the vine should be the same life that is in the branches. And the the Galatians were cutting off this life supply by going to try and manufacture a changed life. And Paul was saying, reckon yourself dead. 
Christ tells us to take up our cross and follow him daily. He tells us to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him daily. The purpose of that cross is for us to nail the flesh to it daily. Paul was saying as a practice, exchange your life for the life of Christ. Maybe you won't get it right the first day. Maybe you won't the second day. But by faith, you believe in the life of Christ. It may seem simple, but it is an act of faith that Christ, I mean, that Paul was teaching. Paul was saying, it is by faith that I now live. It is by faith in the Son of God that now I am expressing Christ through my vessel. And so when we pray, we, the, the, the goal is to say, Lord, take my life. Take this habit that I have. Take this anxiety that I have. Take this lustful thoughts that I have. I surrender them at your cross and I nail them to the cross. Now give me your life. The way that you view other people, may I view them that way today. And the life that is in the vine will begin to flow through your vessel. So much so that you will begin to see fruit hanging on your branch. Not because you manufactured it, but because you remain connected and strove, strive to remain connected to the source of true life. I put up here a quote from a book called Sit, Walk, Stand. And in it is an example of a prayer that we can pray. Lord, it is clear to me at last that in myself I cannot love at all. But I know now that there is a life within me, the life of thy son, and the law of that life is to love. It cannot but love. When we understand that we are meant to live the life of Christ, we begin to draw on the virtues that flow from his very life. That may it not be me or any, any manufactured um, virtue that I'm going to try and display, but may it be your very life flowing through me today. We have faith in Christ's life living within us by his spirit. Lord, let your life, the life that is in the vine, flow through my character and conduct. And trust in his life and not on your effort. The effort of a branch is to remain connected, not to manufacture fruit. And we connect by faith. Because when we try and manufacture a changed life based on what we know, we will go, go to God and we will seek his virtues. We will seek holiness. We will seek humility. We will seek purity. But we will seek it in such a way that we are going to God and asking him to sell us fruit. We go to God and, 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 and pretend that he's a vendor on the street. And we say, God, give me two parts of humility and three parts of grace today. And please give me a side, a side order of purity at no extra charge. We become, based off our knowledge of good and evil, we become the maestro of how God is meant to allot life to us so that we can complete the places that we feel are deficit in our holy life. We become the one who goes to God and say, God, give me that fruit and that fruit and that fruit. But Christ isn't selling fruit. Christ isn't hawking these virtues. Christ is life itself. Christ is the tree of life. He is the vine, and he is the one who provides life to us. We surrender our life and exchange it for his life wholesale. Because all of these virtues flow from his life. He's not selling them, he is the source of life. And when we connect to him, then the fruit begins to be seen in our life. We do not go to God and say, give me the fruit. We say, God, I have faith in your life within me. May I bear fruit through that connection. You cannot come to the tree of life alive, is what Paul teaches. Because Paul says, I have been crucified. And he's, after that, he says, now I live the life of Christ through me. If we come to the tree of life alive, we will not be ready to receive the life that Christ is ready to give. If we're not ready to surrender our lives at his feet continually, the life of Christ cannot flow through us. And hence, Christ cannot express himself through our lives. This is how branches bear fruit. 
we connect to him by believing. And after you have prayed this way, you walk through the day believing that the life of Christ will be made manifest through you. That you will be more loving and less bitter. That you will serve where you are slothful. And that you will obey God even in the little things. We won't get it perfect, but when we pray to God at the end of the day, and when we do a recon, we then once again exchange the pitfalls of our life for more of Christ. In the end of the day, when you do a recon, you say, God, I failed here, 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 and here. Again, at your feet, I surrender these parts of my life. Give me your life so I may go forth once again and express you today. It is a life of faith because we are counting upon his life. We are banking on his life through us to live right and to act right through our day. It's almost like if you're gambling, you put all your chips and all your chips are going in to his life. That if I'm to act right in any way today, it will be because of Christ. And not because I remembered to be less bitter. Or not because I remembered to be less doubtful. Or not because I remembered to be less lustful in my thoughts but because Christ's life is what I am counting on to be expressed through my vessel today. So we have faith in this life. And Paul is saying that we exchange who we are for Christ as a lifestyle. How then shall we live? We shall live by Christ whose life is living and active through us. This is not a passive process. It's one you consciously engage You consciously engage God because it is the aspects or rather the areas that the Holy Spirit highlights you to that he's calling you to allow his life to flow in that area. If he's highlighting the area of moral purity, then go to God and say, God, this is an area where I need your life. Don't go go and say, okay, I'm going to try and be better. Or like the Galatians, have a list of customs to say that this is what I'm going to follow in order to preserve the life that I have. You've had no life except the life that Christ has given you, and hence we depend upon it fully, not just at the point of salvation like the Galatians, but we walk out in the life of Christ, or rather are powered by the life of Christ day by day by day. And that is what Paul is trying to communicate to the Galatians, because he knows that no other message will work, I mean, no other message will get through if they do not get this right. If this is not set in place, the church in Galatia may manufacture or try and manufacture a changed life, but all that it will produce is death. Because anything that is cut off from the source of life, the tree of life that is Christ Jesus, is death. There's a quote I have put by Charles Spurgeon that says, I do not know a better epitome of Christian experience than this. This is the daily walk of a true child of God. If he liveth any other sort, then he liveth not a Christian's life at all. Christ living in us, ourselves living upon Christ, and our union to Christ being visibly maintained by an act of simple faith in him. This is the true Christian's life. What Spurgeon was saying in the 19th century is as applicable today. He was saying Christian li- a true Christian life is faith in the life of Christ. A faith that, I mean, a, a life that we connect to by faith. And it is relevant because the problem the Galatians had is a contemporary problem we have in the church today. How then shall we live? And I know this because in my Christian life, I have been on both extremes. I have been on the extreme side of grace, which is saying that, okay, anything can go, and if I fail, yeah, God, God got my back, and I can keep going and living life this way. But I've also been to the other extreme where it's like I need to follow the laws of God because the laws of God are actually his representative of who he is, and if I don't follow the laws of God, I will use grace as a license to sin. And what I found is that even as I strive to find a middle, the more I strive to find a middle, the more I understand that there is no middle except what is in Christ. 
because it's the life that flows from Christ that is perfectly calibrated all the time. A Chuck, I mean, a, an, a, a quote from Chuck Swindoll says, too often we lose ourselves at the extremes. We either end in a legalistic attempt to earn our salvation or we have a devil-may-care attitude about our sin. Because on one extreme, we have those that live out a Christian life using grace as a license to sin, seeking no effort to live the life of Christ. They approach the tree of life. They are thankful for the tree of life. They sing songs to the tree of life, but they're full of their old life, and they have no intentions of seeing the flesh die on the cross. They sing wonderful songs and attend church, but in their life, they know that the old life is still vibrant within them, and they have no intentions of surrendering it. And so, they aren't able to experience life from the tree of life that is Christ. And on the other extreme, we have the Galatians, who began by faith, but end up in legalism, trying to manufacture a changed life, acting out Christ-like virtues by carnal effort and frustration. And what these people do is they ignore the tree of life altogether. The answer is not at either of these extremes, and even from this study, the answer is not even in the middle. The answer is in Christ. How shall we live? Give me more of Christ, Lord. That's how we are meant to live. And then count upon his life that is made available to us by his Spirit. At the end of Galatians 5, from verse 22 to 25, this is what Paul writes. He says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Paul says this is how you bear fruit. You crucify the sinful nature daily, and you allow the life of Christ to flow through you. You do this enough times, and then the fruits of love will begin to hang off over your life. The fruits of joy and peace and kindness and patience and self-control will begin to hang from your branch because you are remaining connected to the source of life by faith. This is how fruit is born, because the life that is in the vine is the same life that should be in the branches. The next point I want to make is living in fullness, not balance. John 1, 14 to 16 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as the Son of as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The verses say of Christ that he came from the Father full of grace and truth. And truth here speaks in the moral sphere. It speaks about morality. It speaks about being straightforward. And the Galatians tended towards moral excellence by work and adherence to the law. But they left grace behind. And in other places in the Bible, we see Paul write similar letters to other churches who were off balance on the other end of the spectrum. For example, the Corinthians embraced grace and left truth and morality behind. So which is it? Should it be a balance of the two or somewhere in the middle? I love John 1 because John 1 says none of the above. John 1 says Christ was full of grace and truth. Not half grace or half truth or a balance between grace and truth. No, Christ was full of grace and full of truth. He was all of grace and he was all of truth. And one may ask, how can the two seemingly coexist? They can only in Christ Jesus. 
That is the only place where calibration exists between these two. It is both virtues in their full fullness held together in a person. And that person is Christ Jesus himself. It is not balance, but fullness. This is the life that Christ lived in the flesh. He was full of grace and full of truth. And what we are meant to live is a life that is Christ, not one of balance, but one of fullness. Because verse 16 says, for from his fullness we have all received. We have received his fullness. We have received his life through his spirit. In Christ, all virtues are found in perfect measure, in full measure, and in perfect calibration. How then shall we live? We shall live out of the fullness of life that is Christ. This means that we no longer have to measure out grace and respond according to our own recipe. Or we don't have to try and find the balance as I have done many times. And sometimes I try to find the balance myself. But what scripture says is Christ was full of grace and full of truth. And if I have more of Christ, I have more of that calibration. If I have more of Christ, I will know how to speak and when to, when to exercise grace and when to be stern. I will know when to speak on the law and when to exercise grace. Because Christ, in Christ, all of these things exist in their full measure. On every action and on every thought, I will respond as Christ would if I am filled with Christ. We seek to be filled with Christ through His Spirit. And His life then begins to flow through us. Because God has made Him Christ to us in 1 Corinthians 1.13. It's verse, chapter 1, verse 30 to 31, it says the following. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts, boast in the Lord. What he's saying is that everything that we ever hoped to need, sanctification, redemption, righteousness, are all found in Christ. Wisdom is in Christ, and God decided to locate all of these virtues in him. So whether it's sanctification that you need, whether it's wisdom that you need, whether it's redemption that you need, all flow from the life of Christ. Fullness is found in the life of Christ and not a man-made balance of virtues or an independent cocktail of morality, but fullness of which we have all received has been received by grace, upon grace, upon grace, upon grace, as John says in chapter 1. A life lived by faith is how we are meant to live. And Paul says to the Galatians, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Not by effort, but by faith. The same way a branch has faith, it will bear fruit of the tree that it's connected to, is how we have faith that our lives will exhibit the fruit of the Spirit as long as we remain connected to the life of Christ. If we are practically exchanging our lives at his feet every day, saying, today I die to doubt, I die to anxiety, I die to lust, I die to uh, bitterness, I die to hate, I die to envy, I die to jealousy, and Lord, when I go out in my day, may I express your life. Because Christ, you express love, you express kindness, you express patience. Your life has been one of self-control when you walked here, when you walked the earth. May I live in the same way today. And we go counting on the life of God, believing in it. Final quote. God has given us Christ. There is nothing now for us to receive outside of him. The Holy Spirit has been sent to produce what is of Christ in us, not to produce anything that is apart from or outside of him. We are strengthened with power through his spirit in the inward man to know the love of Christ, Ephesians 3. What we show forth outwardly is what God has first put within. In closing, I would like to highlight a key fact about this truth, and that this truth is experiential. Because John 17, 3 says, and this is eternal life, 
that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And that word there, to know, is to know in experience, through personal experience. It is not a head knowledge. It is not remembering this sermon in your head. But it is experiential. It is exp it's to experientially know God. That is eternal life. The life that flows from the vine is how we are meant to live. It is what we are meant to know and how we are meant to experience it. I cannot guarantee that you remembering this sermon will allow you to experience this life. But if you practice what I have said, and you actually meditate on the Word of God and understand that we surrender and exchange our lives daily, we nail our flesh to, and our sinful nature to the cross daily in exchange for His life, you'll begin to see the life of Christ flow through you experientially. Eternal life isn't just never seeing hell. Eternal life is knowing Christ from Scripture, but also experiencing Him. And there's an experiential dimension where we experience God's love towards us, yes. But there's also an experiential dimension where we experience His life through us. That you begin to see Him in your life, to say, I see Him now in the way that I love others. I see Christ in how I have lived free from immorality for the past years. I see Christ in how I serve with passion and vigor that is not my own. I see him in the strength and peace I have in the storm, and I see him in how I live out my life. Because what I'm seeing is not me. What I'm seeing is Christ himself. At the end of the book, in the book of Revelations, it says around the throne there are 24 elders, and the 24 elders have crowns on their heads. And those crowns on their heads get submitted to Christ because they cast those crowns at his feet. And the reason they cast them at his feet is because they know it is his life that got me this crown. It is the life of Christ that we boast about. So that even when Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, He's saying, follow me because I see Christ through me. Paul is saying, I know how I used to live. I know how I used to hate Christians. I know how I persecuted them. But now I see a life that is powered not by myself, but by Christ himself. I see how I passionately preach the gospel, how I get beat up, laid for dead. And when I wake up in the morning, there's a life within me that drives me back into the city to preach the gospel. Paul is saying, follow me as I follow Christ because I am now experiencing another life through me. I'm experiencing Christ himself. And one day in glory, we will cast our crowns before his throne. Because we'll know it is his life that we lived. We'll know that it was his life that was flowing through our veins, our vessels. It wasn't me that loved those people on earth. It was you, Christ, living through me. And all glory will go back to him because it was sourced in him. As branches, we remain connected to God through faith. We remain connected to the vine through faith. We do not manufacture fruit on our own. We do not manufacture a changed life. What we do is we surrender our life and we kill the flesh daily on the cross. And in exchange for that, we say, Christ, live through me. Express yourself through me. And when people look at us, they'll say, those are little Christs, like it was in Antioch. They'll say, those are little Christs because we see the Christ in the Bible in their lives. And that fruit will be hanging from our lives but will not be the glory of the branch, it will be the glory of the vine who is Christ himself. And that is how we bear fruit. And that is how we should live. How then shall we live? We shall live by the life of Christ that flows through our veins. I mean, through our lives. So may we all say that we know him because we have experienced his love towards us. 
but also may we say that we know him because we see his life living through us. That the things I used to do, I no longer do them, and I cannot take credit for that because it is the life of Christ himself. May we stand and pray. from Ephesians 3:14 to 19. And this is the Paul that prayer pray, Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus. He said, "For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It is fullness that we seek, not balance. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your life. We thank you for your truth. I pray, Father, that you meet each and every one of us today, wherever we are on the spectrum, wherever we have been abusing grace in our life, have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy on us. May we, Lord Jesus, be willing to take up our cross daily and follow you. May we be willing to nail our sinful nature to that cross. And may we begin to see your life flow through us. And Lord, I also pray, Lord, if we have been on the side of legalism, And we've been frustrated by the ways that we cannot keep your laws. I pray, Father God, you reintroduce us to the tree of life. Reintroduce us to the joy that we experienced in salvation. I pray, Father God, that we all here may be filled with the fullness of Christ by his spirit. May we be filled, may we be full of grace, may we be full of truth. May we live as you, Christ Jesus, in our daily daily character and conduct not by our efforts, but by your life flowing through us. May your life that is in you, the true vine, the tree of life, make its way through our lives. And may we allow that life to find expression through our beings. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.